Well, hello, internets. Let's go ahead and turn down this music. And uh, how is everybody doing? If uh, you could please chime in that you can hear me fine and Twitch and um, on Facebook and on YouTube, then uh, we can get going. Today is going to be kind of an exciting time. Uh, we have our model retopoed. I'll go ahead and turn on um, do a quick BPR render here so you can see it. So as you can see, we have it retopoed, but um, I will go into Maya and retopo a few parts just to kind of give you an idea of how this process works and then um, probably load that retopo thing back into ZBrush and work on it there. So I did do a little bit of work on it uh, over the weekend, but, um, but I will not use that work uh, this time around. I will just basically um, just kind of continue more or less from where we left it off last week. So, um, okay, good on YouTube. It seems like you're hearing me well, and I'm going to just go ahead and assume. Okay, good. So um, I know, yeah, they, they messed up the uh, calendar. So uh, I'm, I'm really um, sorry. I think they probably are exhausted from the amazing uh, ZBrush Summit they, uh, uh, they put together last week. And if you guys did not see the sessions, I highly recommend you go and watch the videos if you don't didn't watch them live. Uh, a lot of really great information in there. So um, so yeah, uh, please um, kind of uh, you know pardon them for not having the listing on ZBrush Live. But uh, I guess you guys that have been following me know that I'm on every other Friday and uh, I'm on from seven to nine. So we should be good. If you were uh, waiting for Brandon. Um, I think his uh, session is tomorrow. I'm not sure. So you might want to check the schedule and uh, probably um, it'll be more up to date next Monday or so. Okay. Um, so for those of you that were here last time, we basically did a lot of um, the interior, right? So we uh, went in here and uh, did the seats. So let me turn those on, turn this car off for now. And maybe we don't need to see the spoiler and the dro drone here, but uh, just go in and take a look at the seats. And uh, let me see, is this on solo? It is not. So let's go ahead and take a look at those. So these are the seats uh, we kind of worked on. I think we got them to a better state. So let me go into the interior here, turn that on and maybe turn these seats off. So we worked on this last week. So we kind of have some nicer um, seats uh, that are um, almost uh, in a uh, done state. And um, here I kind of have the guys, uh, the model, uh, the, um, the kind of the stand-in uh, drivers in place, but, uh, and they're all merged with this one um, one um, seat, but here I can just go ahead and um, maybe select these guys and invert the selection so you can see the seats themselves. And I think we ended up um, last time with kind of here are the seats, turn off polyframe. So these are the seats we worked on and we started working on the throttle and I'll probably do a little bit more work on the interior, but um, I'm going to kind of use some tricks to bring out a lot of the details in here. Uh, I've got the primary shapes in place, so all I need is like some knobs and um, different things. So I might use some kit bash parts to add those and uh, bring up the, um, so put some controls in there to make it more interesting to look at. So here's this. And um, so today what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the exterior of the, the car and we're going to work on that. So, um, all right, let's see. Uh, can you guys hear me okay on, um, I think Twitch, uh, yeah, on Twitch and also on Facebook. If you guys can uh, chime in, that would be awesome. And um, for the retopo, I actually did it in Maya just because it's a little bit faster. So I will bring that up. So here is Maya. Wow, it looks pretty horrible. Uh, with the screen settings that I have. So I'll try to kind of minimize the, all the junk around it to just kind of show you this part. And I'm not going to spend too much time in Maya. And I guess I could hide 
this timeline and all that stuff. So let me just go ahead and um, go into screen settings here and uh, maybe hide some of these components. Let me see if I can just go to modeling here. Maybe that'll do it. Here we go. This is good. And um, so here we uh, we have uh, kind of the model loaded in, and I will show you what are the the steps are that I did to get it um, to the state. And of course, I will not retopo the whole car, but I will do a few parts of it. Okay, so Facebook uh, is good. And how about uh, in on Twitch? If anybody can uh, chime in on Twitch, that would be great. We have quite a few people watching, so uh, it'll be great if uh, one of you on Twitch can just say, okay, good. Uh, Jarmer64, thank you very much. And uh, welcome everybody to the, the stream. Okay, so um, here, basically what I did, if you uh, folks remember about a, from a couple of weeks ago, what I did here is, I bring out the outliner so you can see it. Um, what I did was I... Uh, basically brought in the car uh, as a, uh, I brought in all the different pieces and also here, I don't really need to look at all the interior uh, guys, but um, all these are hidden, I'll unhide them. Actually, let me hide this thing for now. And I'll bring these up so you can see them. Um, right, so these were all the different parts. Remember, we parted out our model so we have this part, this part, and this part. And actually, when I brought these parts in, uh, they were a lot more detailed than this. And I used the simplify, or here it is, the mesh, uh, mesh reduce option to get these pieces into smaller parts. And then once I got them into smaller parts, uh, what I did was I just kind of had them there for guidelines and then uh, did the retopo actually on the entire car. So I'm going to hide this again and switch back to uh, the full car high res shift h so this basically is the car that i brought in from uh, from zbrush right so here is basically the um, very high resolution version of that car and uh, if you recall i um, dynameshed it or i'm sorry i uh, um, um, not dynameshed but i zero meshed it so it's basically in all quads. I, there's some weird stuff going on here, but that doesn't really matter. And um, so basically, I'm just going to use this as my base to retopo on. And so the first thing I will do is turn this to a live object. So I just click on this magnet. And now that makes this object live. So what that means is that whatever uh, topology I put on here um, is going to stick to the surface of this, right? So I'm really not using any of this. Uh, it's not geometry I can select or anything like that. And let me turn off this heads up display too for um, object details and uh, heads up display. Let me turn a bunch of these things off so you can see more of the car and not the poly count and all this other stuff. I'm going to keep that on, view axis, I'll keep that on. Okay, so, and the other thing I'm going to do here is for symmetry, and this is kind of hard for me to do over here because it's kind of over on the side of this, so I think maybe I can make my UI smaller. Let me see if I can do that real quick. Here, I should have taken a look and seen what this looks like on a smaller screen, but uh, let me see here. Um, settings uh, display there we go and uh, yeah it looks like it's uh, let's see view I don't think there's a place for here in here for me to change it um, interface maybe, and let's see if there's a zoom in here. Yep, it's at 200%. Let's drop that to 150, see what that looks like. And um, just try this. See if it works. Nope. I might have to restart my effort to work. Anyway, I think we can work this way. I'm not going to spend too much time in here, so we'll be good. I think I'll pick the symmetry from here. So one real quick thing here that I'll do is, uh, and you guys are not seeing the preferences. It's just basically over here. So I'm just going to go and 
change this back to what I had before, which was 200, and that's fine. It's just so it doesn't mess me up last time, next time I'm working on a project. Okay, so here we have the car. And um, notice here that I do have a live surface, and I've got symmetry on. So then we just go into this really kind of cool retopology tool in Maya called QuadDraw. And basically what QuadDraw allows me to do is just place points on the surface of this model, right? So here, let's say I'm just going to do this front part over here. And to do that, I just basically place down uh, different points like that and just um, press shift. And that basically allows me to create the topology. So here it looks like I need a couple of edge loops over here like that. So um, all the commands for QuadDraw are down here under keyboard and mouse shortcuts. So you can kind of read up on them. But again, since this is really not a Maya, um, stream. I'm not really going to spend that much time explaining a lot of Maya things. If you have questions um, about Maya, um, then you can probably find them online. I think they do have some areas where they answer questions. But for retopology, there's a lot of different tools out there. I kind of, uh, for if I just have to get something done really quick, I prefer using Maya. But there are other tools out there that are just as good, Topogun being one of them. So if you don't want to really get another whole 3D package, you can use Topogun um, and some other, other tools as well. So here, all I'm doing is just using this kind of quick topology method to go ahead and retopo um, this part right here. So notice I just go very quickly. And part of this, again, uh, Topology is basically one of those things where you can just learn it over time and get better at it. So here I'm just kind of thinking that this topology here is good enough for this part. So then I'm done with this part and then I'll move on to another another piece and then just continue to do that until I get the whole car done. Uh, let's see, do we have any questions about any of this? It seems like we don't, so that's fine. So I'll do another piece here just to kind of give you an idea. Um, if you guys wanted me to do a specific part, let me know in the um, comments, and then I'll do that specific part. So I'll give you a few minutes to kind of catch up. So here we just did this one front piece. And if I want to continue that on, maybe I'll just do that until you decide if there's another piece on this car that you want me to do. And again, here the main point is to make sure that um, I've got all quads, right? And uh, quad draw is good in that way where it basically, well, let me sh make sure auto weld is on. It's uh, really good in the way that it o mostly allows me to create quads, uh, maybe sometimes triangles, but mostly I'm doing uh, quads here, right? So here's this part, then there's this part right here. And uh, what I like about this, um, so there's something similar to this in ZBrush, which is ZSphere um, retopology. And it's nice, but it's not as fast as this as far as kind of putting down the points and moving them around and just rearranging them as I, um, as I finish uh, the model up. So um, that's kind of why I do it in here. Um, but hopefully, maybe soon, either uh, Zero Mesher will get good enough where I'd never have to do this again, uh, or they will have maybe some other retopo tools in, in ZBrush where I won't have to even leave ZBrush to do this kind of work. Okay, so um, I'm looking at the questions here, and I don't seem to have any. Um, so I will assume that you guys don't really care what part I do, and maybe I'll just do this door over here. So um, I don't know what this green color here is, but it doesn't matter. So here I'm just basically going in and uh, just placing the dots down and putting the topology in place for this door, trying to figure out what it is. Now, another thing to consider here is that um, the topology has an outline. And I usually make the, so I haven't really done it here, I should. I usually leave room a little bit, so I don't do this to the edge, but I kind of leave some room on the outside because I like to add an edge loop that goes around the model that kind of outlines it out. And I can either do this here in Maya or I can do it in ZBrush. And uh, actually I will uh, do it in ZBrush because it's kind of cooler uh, and ZBrush does it a lot better um, because it has the inset command in uh, the Z modeler, which makes life a lot easier. Um, Let's see, we got a couple of questions from Christian and Mr. Sanson. Um, 
yes, Christian, this is a continuation of a pre previous stream. So basically, um, I guess this would be a good time to let everybody know if, if uh, you guys don't know. Uh, let me just create a new browser window here. Or I'll just bring this up. So yeah, here, um, I guess I'll just start out with showing you this. So in the broadcast calendar here for October 5th, which I think is tomorrow, they've got Brandon, but for some reason they don't have me on here. Um, I think they might've just forgotten to put it on there, uh, but that's fine. Uh, it's It should be on here. And I'm going to be continuing this by the way, into October and also into November. Um, so I'm gonna do another four because we just have a lot of work to do. And, um, as for your question here, if you go to, uh, I, I'll just go to YouTube here. So if you go to the, um, let's go to, where is YouTube? It's the first one. So if I just go to YouTube here and go to the Pixelogic channel right here, you will notice that in the Pixelogic channel, there's a bunch of videos and uh, I'm sure Twitch has a similar thing. Um, oh, actually, I should also mention that ZBrush Live does have it too. So let me go to zbrushlive.com. And if you look for me, if you look for presenters here, uh, you'll find me somewhere down here. Uh, where am I? Uh, Let's see, here we go. So if you look at my, uh, if you go to my um, page, I guess, if you scroll down, you will see that I've, these are all the different ones. So notice here that this is uh, season two. So season one was this robot and this robot took about nine episodes to do, uh, about eight and one episode was just talking about the new features of ZBrush 2019. And then uh, season two, we started with this. So this has been, I think about maybe um, looks like about five episodes. So today we're doing episode six. So you can either find this on, on the ZBrush Live website, or you can also go to the um, ZBrush uh, channel on YouTube. And uh, you can just kind of either do a search, or if you scroll down, you will see me. Here's, um, here's one episode. And so you can d see the different episodes, right? So you can watch it after the fact. Uh, or you can watch it live. The benefit, of course, of watching live is that um, you get to ask questions and you get to interact with me, which makes uh, it a lot more fun, both for me and uh, for the folks uh, that are watching it. Okay, and then Mr. Sanson, you said, where do you render your models for presentation? So um, I will be rendering this in Keyshot uh, for, um, and we will probably be doing that uh, pretty soon here. We'll, we'll throw it into Keyshot to see what it looks like. Probably not today, but either next week or the week after, we'll start kind of working on the presentation aspects. Okay, so let's go back to the door here and notice that when I retopo, I basically try to get uh, really big pieces first. I don't try to put in a lot of edge loops in the beginning. I try to get the minimum amount of geometry to get the shape to show up. And um, the good news is that all of these are basically are right on the surface of the model, which makes life a lot easier. And so I'm just going to extend this all the way to here. Notice I'm just going to do, I can do, if I can do big chunks, I tend to do big chunks when I retopologize just because it makes life easier later on. And so now here's basically the whole door. And if I want, I'll probably put another edge loop here. And notice as soon as I put that edge loop here, it kind of popped out just because it wants to hug the surface. And I try to get something minimal like this. I think this is good enough uh, for reef topology. I don't really need to add a lot more edge loops, uh, but you notice in its kind of its initial state, if I just had something like this, it would be good enough uh, to start out with. And then when I load it into ZBrush, I can use ZModeler to add more edge loops if I need to. All right, if I need to do this piece here, I'll just kind of do it like that, oops. like so and make sure it's all quads and then if I need to attach it to this I can but basically this is the process. So after I do this for a while right I end up with a model and um, so um, here is the I think it's this one is the one I want so I'm just gonna go is right turn off quad draw and I think this is what we get, right? So after I'm done, I basically get this, and let me isolate that so you can see it. 
like so. So you can see I just get this geometry and then I export this or gozi it back into ZBrush. Okay. So uh, just to give you an idea of what I did, so I'm not really going to keep these. I'm just going to get rid of them because I've already done this and this is kind of the end result. Um, turn isolate off here and turn isolate back on. So this is kind of the last thing I got, right? So I used the exact same process. Um, the only thing here is that you see that this is a lot busier over here than what I had before. And the reason for that is because this is inheriting a lot of edge loops that are coming from other parts of the model. And I have this all as one, one model and I have it all as all quads. So this is an all quad model. And the reason why I have the coloring here, uh, and I basically use the uh, uh, the coloring of polygons, uh, coloring of faces in Maya, um, I use that to color the different sections because it makes it easier for me to kind of break them out once I get into ZBrush. Okay, so this is the end result that I have. And I export this as a FBX or OBJ file, and then I load that into ZBrush. So I'm going to be moving off of Maya. If you have any Maya-based questions, uh, please ask them now. Tim, hi, how's it going, man? Good to see you. And uh, again, if anybody has any Maya questions and Retopo in Maya questions, this would be a good time to ask. Otherwise, we're just going to move it into ZBrush and start working in ZBrush. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of this off my screen over here and close it out and uh, just go back into ZBrush over here and um, let's go ahead and take a look at what we've got right so I'm going to turn off the interior we're not going to look at the interior for now and let's go ahead and look at the model that I have so this is basically the retopo model that I have in ZBrush and let me go ahead and turn on polyframe here. So this is the exact same thing that we had. I just brought it into ZBrush. And then what I'm going to do at this point is start breaking it up again into the separate parts. And remember, I had the different colors on in Maya. So um, I can easily spot which ones they are and then break it out into uh, different parts. So I've kind of done that earlier and this is what that looks like, right? So here I've basically broken out all of those into separate pieces and also I've added that inset in here as well. So the way I do that, it's pretty simple. It's just, you know, I'll do it over again. Um, let me go ahead and hide this and show this and uh, yep let's go ahead and select that so here you can see that I've got all the different parts like so broken out right so each one of these is its own part and the way I do that is again I bring in the color uh, colored version that I had in Maya and I just basically select them and select the polygons and uh, separate them out, right? So um, then I basically have all of these different pieces. Now, in addition to separate, when I separate them out, they look something like this. So let me just do that with one part so you get an idea of how that's done. Uh, let me hide this and I'm just going to go to this piece right here. And uh, turned on. Okay, and, oh, sorry, I chose the wrong piece. This one right here. Right, so let's say this is it. And what I want to do is I want to separate out the, um, just this kind of uh, windshield, right? So what I would do here is I would just go ahead and uh, go to the Poly uh, Z Modeler brush, and I would choose uh, Polygroup. And the single poly is fine. Another uh, really cool thing to do is to also use the brush radius. So, um, I, you know, this kind of works well as well. So I'll just do it this way. Oops. Right, so you can kind of see that as I'm moving my brush on here, I'm selecting a bunch of polygons. So you can either do it this way and let me also turn on symmetry here. Um, let me load my custom UI. 
oops, config and load restore custom UI. There it is. So let's hide black box. So if I press A, heat control A, I'm just going to activate symmetry. So I'm selecting things on both sides. So I can either select a big, big swap, big bunches. And let me turn off edge and point here. So if I go to edge, do nothing. And if I go to vertex, do nothing. So you can see here, I can select big chunks of this in one piece like that. Right. So, and then when I want to kind of work more in detail, I'll just go and say poly groove, just a single poly. And then um, I'll just go in and individually select all the different polygons and click on them so I can get kind of a good edge going here. Right. So here I'm just basically selecting what is going to be my windshield. Right. So I can either do this one piece by piece or I can do it all in one chunk. So here we go. Let's say I'm going to do all this. And this is going to be the windshield all the way to here like so. All right, let's see. Do you keep hard edges or soft edges when you export out of Maya? It looks mixed. Um, I export it as just hard edges. I don't bring in any um, any um, smoothing at all. I'll do all that in ZBrush as time goes on. Uh, okay, so here I'm just going by and figuring out what part of this is going to be the windshield. I think it goes this way all the way to here. So these are all the different parts here in the front. And I think this this goes about, I think it goes all the way down to here. So I just kind of manually have to select these. Again, um, if I choose a brush size, it will do more of them, but I think this works fine for now. Okay, oops. All right, so here basically more or less I have uh, the windshield. I'm just, I just wanna make sure I have I guess I go all the way to here on this, right? Yep, I do. Okay, so the windshield is just all this entire piece right here. Okay, so now that I know that I've got this windshield all in one piece, right? I just go to, and let me make sure I've got the back correctly here. And basically I'm just referring to my model on the other screen just to make sure that I've got all of the pieces that I want. I think these are included as well. Okay, so here is kind of the, uh, the the windshield, and what I'll do at this point, let me duplicate this. So I have a copy of it, right? And let's hide that one. And with this new duplicate, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go do split, and I'm going to do group split, and okay. And so now I have this in two separate pieces, right? So I've got one piece, that's the car, and another piece that's the windshield and here is the windshield okay now the good news is that i know that all this is butting up against those uh, those other pieces so as i retopo each one they'll work out really good so the first thing i do here is i'll go ahead and i want to put a border edge around this so that it holds these edges and the way I do that is, again, uh, it's really elegant. I haven't really found a way to do this in Maya, and uh, ZBrush does it just so nicely. So what I'll do here is I'll go over here and say Inset. So I'm choosing Inset here, and we're going to inset all the polygons, and we're going to do uh, Inset um, Center Only, right? So the first thing I'm going to do is just add a little bit of room between these two edges. So now when I do this, what it's, <laughs> yeah, one more thing is do inset region. So it doesn't do every polygon. So now basically I can make this a little bit smaller. So all I'm doing here is just kind of creating a little bit of room for me between um, these two sides. So I can either do it that way or another thing, the better way to do it is to go ahead and do inset uh, region like so. And, uh, and not have the inside, but have both center and border. And so when you do that, notice what uh, ZBrush does, and this is like a very, very cool thing, is it basically just builds a ring around this object. So by building that ring around the object, what it will do is basically it will give me kind of a border so that now if I go to dynamic subdiv, 
right, uh, it maintains as much of that edge as possible close to what I have on the other side. And then when I do the same thing on the other side and do the same thing, then I'll have some uh, really nice kind of clean edges. Uh, and if I crease these, if I crease the outside edge, which let's also do that, then I'll get an exact, and let me solo this out. And if I crease the outside edge, so here I'll just go to crease and I'll say edge loop complete. So now this is going to be, I'll just go ahead and crease out these edges and I've got symmetry on, so it's gonna happen on the other side too. Um, so I just want to make sure if I crease these on outside edges as well, and if I go to dynamic subdiv, notice that these edges will stay nice and crisp. All I got to do is just worry about these corners over here. And if I crease uh, this edge over here, like so, um, oops. And the other thing also, and by the way, another thing to do if you don't want to crease them is you can uh, inset the whole thing one again as well. And that will give you yet another edge, right? That's going to hold that. And now if I go to dynamic subdiv, I still get a little bit of uh, smoothing around the edges, but uh, it, it holds that um, a little bit better. And uh, again, the only thing I need to worry about is these corners. So now if I just crease this one edge, and I'll just do it as a single edge, I don't need to do the whole edge loop. So if I do just crease a single edge and just crease that edge, like so, then it will hold that sharp corner. So if I go to dynamic subdiv, you notice that I still have that sharp corner. Okay, so um, this is the thing, thing that I do uh, first. So let me bring up the rest of the car so you can see them together. And you can see here that, um, I don't know what, what happened there, but let me switch back down yep so you can see here that between this and this there's a little bit of a gap there but it's holding it at it really well and so if I do the same thing that I did with this windshield with the rest of the parts of the body I will get a pretty good kind of a representation of uh, the object I mean it's not CAD obviously it's not NURB so I'm not going to get really really smooth edges but for what I need to do here it works out really nice um, and I have one of these already done. Uh, so let's go ahead and look at that, which is this over here, right? So this is exactly doing the same exact process to all of the different parts. And then I basically get a car that looks like this. And this is all one, uh, one piece right now. So it's just one subtool and it has all these parts. And if I go to dynamic subdiv, right, it looks like this. And um, it basically has a little bit of overlap over here where the parts are, but it's fine. And you can see that I've got a little bit of kind of fixing up to do over here. But again, I'm going to be looking at this thing as a whole car. And let me turn off polyframe. So if I turn off polyframe, a lot of these lines will be okay. And I might need to do some cleanup, but I also want to stress to you uh, here that this is a very low poly model, right? So this is very, very low poly. Um, if we're really looking at it, um, this is about maybe um, 31,000 polygons, so 32,000 polygons, which is almost nothing uh, for a whole car. So if I want to make any changes at this point, I can do that uh, and I can manipulate this, subdivide it and work with it as needed. And uh, also I will, you know, to note here that like there are some areas where there's like a bit of a gap over here. And if I just use the uh, move brush with AccuCurve on, uh, it's, um, you know, and also turn topological on. So this is topological over here. I can uh, very easily kind of, uh, you know, uh, tweak these so they touch each other. So here, maybe choose a smaller brush size and just tweak this one corner and bring the corners together so that when I go to dynamic subdiv um, like so then that kind of edge oops that edge is kind of smoother over here and notice that one of the areas that kind of has challenges a little bit are these corners and the reason why that is is because it kind of smooths this corner around so to fix that I can just add edge loops so here let me go to the uh, Z modeler brush and uh, go to insert 
and single edge loop and just kind of move that edge loop in there and as you can see here if I add one this way and add one this way I get that sharp corner right so um, yeah uh, this is kind of a really nice way to get good paneling uh, on your car I could have done this with panel loops as well and I did experiment doing it with panel loops but the problem with panel loops also is that you don't really get uh, as good of a definition so there's different ways again of doing the same thing uh, to get the types of results that you want. So here is basically the end result of me having the model parted out topologically. Okay, so um, let's see if there are any questions. Looks like there are not. So I will continue on. All right, so at this point, I just have to start thinking about, okay, well, I want this model to uh, basically, now I'm modeling this in a different way. It's not just, it is all in one subtool, but it's different pieces, and eventually I will be breaking those pieces up. Uh, and I'll also be adding detail individually to each one of the pieces, right? So um, I just wanna make sure here that to come in and start adjusting all the different pieces here so that I do get those sharp corners the way I want them. So at this point it's just a little bit of a really kind of detailed work to get this to kind of to work the way I want. So that kind of uh, did this piece and 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 by the way uh, some of these are glass and maybe I should have them be their own pieces. So, um, yeah, um, so this kind of big windshield here is a piece of glass. This front part is a, is a piece of glass. This bottom one is a, a piece of glass. So uh, one thing I can do here is maybe have those all be one polygroup color, but for now I think it's fine. So, um, so this is going to be a piece of glass as well. So there's a lot of glass in the front part of the car. So we can see the interior that we modeled. And then uh, there's a lot of metal parts as well. And the other thing also is that I kind of forgot to put lights in here. So I might maybe do that today. Um, all right, so now it's basically just taking each individual piece here and making sure that it, it kind of conforms to what we want. And uh, here is the original sculpt that we did. So this is the original sculpt. So I bring that up as well, like so. And let me uh, move that to the side. And we can see both of these together. Okay, so these are the two different variations. And eventually I want this to look more like this. Right, so um, this is all kind of one piece. It was just kind of a sculpt that we did. I think we did that in episode one or two, maybe uh, yeah, one or two, we kind of came to this shape. And so I don't know what these are, these little pokey parts over here, that's not supposed to be there. But um, basically what we want to do is we want to get this type of detail with these parts. So what I need to do is start working on them uh, to get that detail. So for now, I'm just going to um, take this one and undo it back to its original location. Right there, and um, just maybe turn on transparency. Got another piece here too. So this piece over here, let's go ahead and take a look at this too. So this model over here is basically, I guess I'll hide this one also. is um, saw that part. So that's just basically all the different parts. So you can see here, let me turn on polyframe. So this is kind of that part that I had. And notice here that I also went in and did that inset. So I do get those border edges, right? So there's that part. Here's this part right here, which is uh, another part that I need. And if I turn solo off, I basically get the car this way, right? So this is kind of the car all broken up into separate pieces. And uh, let me hide the original one. 
as you can see, things get pretty busy. So naming things is a good idea. I've really not done uh, any naming of the individual parts. I tried to do that off camera, so to speak, so that uh, I don't bore you with sitting here and renaming everything. But it's a good idea to have everything renamed. And eventually, I will have that have it that way. So here, it's exactly the same thing we were looking at before, uh, but it's all in different pieces, right? So here is this one. Right, so there's that part, and then there is this part right here. And if I turn transparency on, you can kind of individually see them. And as I go through the car, you can see that each one of them is an all quad uh, part that I've separated things into. And so I can individually work on these parts. Right, okay, so that's kind of what we're going to do today is work on these individual parts and get them to be what we want. So I'm gonna go back to this one right here and get it back to its original state. We don't really need to mess around with this one. Um, and let me do a quick save real quick just to make sure I've got a, a good save of this. And then we'll start working on the parts individually. All right, so it looks like we've got quite a, a few people in here. Any questions that you have, this would be a good time to ask while we're doing the save. All right, um, no questions, uh, which means you either know what's going on, uh, everything of what's going on, or maybe this is not something that you've done in ZBrush, which I can understand because um, a lot of times ZBrush is not used for hard surface stuff. Uh, I tend to use it quite a bit for hard surface stuff, so you're going to see a lot of kind of this type of work from this point forward. Um, and the next uh, season three is going to be a mech. And uh, that'll probably start somewhere either uh, early next year or um, yeah probably early next year is when I'll, I'll start that okay well okay we got a bunch of questions now uh, we're gonna do good um, Ruth I'm, I'm not a, a new streamer I've actually uh, been streaming for quite a while I've had two seasons of streaming and uh, you can see my previous uh, episodes by going to ZBrush live looking up my name and uh, seeing my information there um, how often do you run into technical issues with any of the software uh, like if bugs and whatnot um, well <laughs> I guess that's a good good kind of question to ask because um, there's a couple of things to consider. One is that all software crashes, right? I don't think there's any software that's ever written that's never crashed, right? Every software has issues at some point. So you always have to um, kind of uh, practice good hygiene, meaning that you have to save often and know when to save. Uh, nice thing about ZBrush is that it's got an automatic quick save feature. So if you've been working for a while, it automatically goes and saves your scene for you. So that if you go into Lightbox and go into quick save, you can see that uh, your uh, previous work has been saved and, and you can just go back to it, right? Um, so that's the first thing. And the other thing is, um, a lot of times people get crashes because they do things that they're not supposed to do, right? So if I have a model that's not a qu all quad model, uh, it tends to sometimes cause the software to crash. So I try to work in quad, especially when I'm in low resolution. And um, I practice a lot of things that are um, topologically sound so that I don't get crashes to happen. ZBrush is pretty solid. I think of all the programs that I, the programs that I use, uh, ZBrush is pretty crash proof for me. Um, so is Maya for all intents and purposes. But um, I tend to have more dramatic crashes in Maya where I can't recover anything. But in ZBrush, since there's a quick save, I can recover from it. Um, I guess there's an incremental save in Maya too, but I've never used it. Um, but yeah, um, so... Uh, I guess to answer your question is that I run into technical issues not that often, but uh, when I do, I always have a save to go back to. And sometimes I lose maybe an hour of work at most, and those are frustrating uh, times, but um, it's just part of the part of the work, I guess. 
Okay, um, Ruth, uh, yeah, I'm glad you're, you know about me, and so please do follow on. So again, I'm on Friday nights every other week, uh, and um, I wanted to make a promo video for the ZBrush Summit, but uh, I was really busy with work and didn't get around to it. So, um, Gasper, Lam Gasper Al Alemo, Alemao, where do I get my inspiration? Google Images, Instagram, Pinterest. Um, that's a good question. And uh, yeah, well, that's the thing. It's like you get into, you know, if you get your projects to be complicated and you run into issues, uh, that means you have to uh, maybe um, make things work when they're not complicated. So here, notice that, I mean, this shape is going to get really complicated as time goes on, but notice that I've got it as an all quad shape, pretty simple geometry here. And then when I subdivide it, uh, I'm going to get um, less problems with this. So you kind of can um, get in front of your problems by making sure that you're, you're working in a way where you have uh, good simple shapes to work with and you're using uh, good modeling techniques uh, to make your model. As far as my inspiration is concerned, I get my inspiration from a lot of different things. Um, luckily, I've had a good visual vocabulary growing up, so uh, a lot of good movies, uh, a lot of um, books that I've read, a lot of pictures I've looked at, a lot of traveling that I've done. So. All those things add to your inspiration and, uh, you know, um, there's plenty of it out there anywhere. You can, you know, go outside, look at a bird for an hour, uh, look at kind of the things that that bird is doing. You can look at a car, uh, see how it's made. You can take apart like something that's broken, uh, see how the innards are. And um, yeah, I mean, inspiration is all around you. Uh, it's just a matter of... Uh, kind of paying attention, spending some time looking at it. Um, looking online at Pinterest and Google images and whatnot is good. But the problem with that is that uh, you basically get what they want to show you. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you want to look at a, a spinner, let's say a car, right? And I'll do that. Let me do that search and you can kind of get an idea of what I'm talking about. And uh, let's see here. I'll bring this browser back up and let's say I'm going to look for a blade runner spinner. Okay, so let's say I'm just going to get some inspiration. So here you can see that uh, the inspiration is there. There's quite a few images. And if I go to images here, uh, fantastic. So there are a bunch of images, but Google chooses to show me these images, right? These images are being shown to me based on Google's decision. So the first thing here is an Amazon.com car. So this is something I can order. Uh, here is a, a Hum 3D uh, 3D model of the one that was in Blade Runner 2049, right? So um, Google chooses to show me these images based on their algorithms. And sometimes those algorithms are good and I find what I need, or sometimes they're not. Right, so if I go to uh, the text here, uh, right, so there's a Wikipedia entry, and uh, I can also go and look for this in Pinterest. But again, the results I'm getting are results they tend to show me. So when I am hunting for my references, I usually do this. Um, and I look at images here, and I look at two pages of images, and if there are ones that are interesting, I usually grab them and put them on my reference sheet. and. Um, but if I don't find them here, then I start doing more research, right? So I start looking at specific websites that are Blade Runner websites, or I look at car websites, or um, I look at, um, you know, so I do a little bit of internet work, but then after the internet, I also do work outside, meaning I have a bunch of books. I look at those books. I go to the library, uh, see if they have any books on that. Uh, I go to... Um, you know, I look at flying cars and any research that's been done on that, if any, there are any books that have been written on it. Um, I look at airplanes and, uh, you know, what kind of um, uh, dynamics does an airplane need? I look and research technology as far as, you know, what kind of levitation uh, is there? And uh, you can find out that there are some levitation technologies, right? So for this one, for example, I did not put in um, any... Um, 
any wheels because I thought, okay, you know what? We're having a flying car. Why do I even need wheels? This thing should be able to hover. So then when I go and do some research on the internet, and let's see if I can find that uh, specific thing. So uh, frozen hover, uh, hovering uh, disk. Let me see if I can find this. And sometimes I basically create shortcuts for these things. So yeah, here it is. So here's uh, quantum levitation, right? So if I were to invent a flying car, I would do this quantum levitation. So that's what the thing is called. So now I go start researching quantum levita levitation. So let's go ahead and look for that, right? So here is a YouTube video. Ah, great. I don't want to watch any ads. So you can kind of see it over here, but let me see if I can go to... Um, it's going to show me an ad too. Yeah, no, good. So here you can see that they've got this part here and it's just levitating, right? So it's levitating upside down and uh, there is some technology here that's making, making this thing levitate, right? So then I go, okay, fine. Quantum levitation. Right, and then I basically look and see if there are any interesting images on that. So here, uh, there's some images. So this has nothing to do with the car. And um, I think this one is the one that I first saw, which basically they uh, hit this disc on a uh, plate and then it goes around. Notice that um, they, they're they looking into doing trains with that. And so here's kind of some idea uh, about a car. So I basically do some research that way and I get inspired by this technology, right? So, uh, and then, um, you know, um, it basically, a maglev is another thing. So magnetics, you know, so I start getting into that. And then I do research on flying cars. Right, and so you can see here that I'm not really looking specifically for a spinner, even though I started there. It looks like there are some ideas for flying cars, so let's go ahead and take a look at those. Okay, so what kind of things have they done for this flying car? And there's quite a few different ideas of flying cars. I, I guess it's something that is pretty popular, so I do research there and get some inspiration from that. Right, so um, doing research and getting inspiration is really, really important, right? So um, it's always good to kind of get a little bit of, of that uh, out of the way in the beginning. I spent maybe uh, a few hours doing that. Sometimes if it's a important project, I spent days doing it. And um, sometimes I do it on the client's dime. Sometimes I do it on mine. But it's always kind of good to have that type of research done before you make your model because you can include factors uh, from that in your model and that would work great. Uh, hopefully that uh, answered your question. Uh, Gasper, Gasparel Lameo. <laughs> there should be some sort of, <laughs> there should be some sort of a Siri thing that basically will pronounce uh, people's online names if they don't use your existing, their existing names. Okay. Um, Five fit, thank you uh, for that. Uh, much appreciated. Okay, so we're back to um, kind of starting to work on this. Okay, so here I'm going to go ahead and turn off uh, transparency so I can see all the parts. And here, what I'm trying to do is I'm going to go ahead and press D for dynamic subdiv. And I'm going to see uh, where the fit is between these parts and adjust, uh, adjust that. Okay, so. Um, Looks like I've got a little bit of a pinch over here. So there are different ways of fixing that. The first thing I would do here is I go, okay, well, what if I add another inset on this top part of this? Um, so I'm going to solo this out and I'm going to try to inset it again. So I'm going to inset the region. Uh, actually, I'm going to inset polygroup border or just polygroup all, just this polygroup. And let's see if that kind of adds a little bit of a harsher. Yep, it did. Right, so I'm getting this border here is pretty good, right? This kind of border is pretty good. Where I'm getting issues is where these angles are happening. And so you can notice here that there's this one's actually even going inwards. So I can either go in here and see if I can fix it just by using the smooth brush. And uh, hopefully I've got symmetry on here. I do. 
and uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and fix that. No, so notice here that this is kind of a softer angle and I want it to be a harsher angle so I would have to add edge loops to do that but for now I'm just going to uh, go ahead and fix this and again if I want to move things around I'm just going to go ahead and use the good old move tool and uh, make sure you have AccuCurve turned on so I have a quick kind of button for it here in my custom UI but uh, I'm sure that you can find where AccuCurve is. I think it's in the brush menu. And it's a pretty useful thing to kind of get sharp edges. So here I just want to get kind of that sharper edge on this corner as well. Right? And one way to do that is you can either bring these uh, loops closer together or you can just add an edge loop. So this is okay, I guess, for a car. And here there's kind of a inlet so I'm just kind of making sure that this kind of comes in and again for a car you want to have pretty smooth straight edges so here I'm just always looking and evaluating the surface and with dynamic subdiv by the way I didn't know if you know this or not but you can actually bump up the subdivision levels so it's at two I can go up to three and I can get even smoother edges and when I turn off the polyframe I can see that there's some bumps over here so I'll just go ahead and very gently smooth those out so I've got really nice sweeping uh, kind of surfaces because that's kind of what you want with a car is just sweeping smooth surfaces. Got okay, a couple of questions. Um, Ian, uh, have I seen origami? Absolutely, yeah. Um, actually, I think uh, BMW did some work with origami with cars, and uh, they look really cool. And uh, I'm actually not that good at origami myself, but my son is, so I'll ask him, see if he can put some input, give me some input on it. Um, but yeah, it, it would definitely be cool if uh, you know origami or folding objects would kind of work out uh, to give a different shape to the object. Um, I think that was a lost opportunity with the transformers. I think using origami for the way the transformers transform would have made more convincing transformations versus the kind of the quick sleight of hand that they used for the cars to change from uh, whatever they are to the robots. Okay, and then um, Ruth, you have another question. Um, Scott Robinson, or you mean Scott Robertson? Um, uh, Sid Mead is a good friend of mine. I actually did a project for Sid Mead um, a while back. So if you guys like Sid Mead's work, there's an app you can download, and it's available for iOS and also for... Um, for uh, Android and um, if you um, if you download there that app and let me see if I can find it here uh, where is it let's bring this back up so here Sid Mead app um, progressions this is it right here so if you go to Google Play or uh, App Store, there's a link for it here. And if you download this app, you can actually point it at a Sid Mead painting and you'll get a 3D model of it. And I worked with the team that put this together, uh, really smart people. And uh, what you can do is if you uh, point your phone at a painting of Sid Mead's, then you basically get the 3D model of it. And I worked on a few of those models myself, uh, which was a great experience. I got to meet Sid and hang out with him, which was a treat. And also, um, Scott Robertson and I are good friends as well. So I get to talk to them a lot. They definitely inspire me um, in, in a big way. Both of them do. Um, they both inspire me both in their work and also and the way they work, right? They're both really amazing artists and uh, I've uh, got all their books and uh, love to uh, learn from them every chance I get. So uh, hopefully that helps, uh, uh, that answers that question. 
what do I use for hard surface? ZBrush. I use ZBrush for hard surface. I use Maya just for retopoing and a few tasks here and there, but mostly ZBrush is my hard surface uh, baby. And I'm one of the few artists uh, that loves to use ZBrush for hard surface. There's a few others, of course, and I think uh, you can get some amazing results with ZBrush with hard surface. Um, how long do you spend on a model from consenting to block out to details to render? Uh, five fit, uh, it depends on the model, right? Uh, for this one, uh, for example here, uh, this would be a good example to talk about. So if you go to my uh, live channel here, so he, we, I made this robot and um, so we started out with that robot pretty early uh, and it was about uh, so my streams run about two hours, right? So basically, um, uh, if I look at eight weeks, two hours, that's uh, eight, basically um, 16 hours total. So that's about maybe two days of work. And we in two days of work, I got a model from nothing. So we started out with kind of basic shapes and, and uh, refined it and refined it. And uh, finally got to the final result here. Uh, which is this model. And by the way, the final result had a different, uh, this model right here. So we had a, a couple of iterations because 2019 came out before uh, before um, I finished the model. So I did a non-photorealistic version, which is a little bit different, which looked like this. And then I continued on and also finished it off and rendered it as well. So I guess for a robot, like this one, I could get it done within about two to three days. And for this car, uh, so far we started out in, uh, so I've got two, four, six, eight, uh, ten hours in so far to where we have. And I did spend some time off screen. So I would say right now I've spent two days on this model, right? Uh, I tend to work very, very quickly because I work in production and uh, they expect very quick results. And so um, I try to get as much done as fast as possible. Hopefully that helps you understand. Um, that said, I also do take my time when I need to. So if uh, I'm working in production and they hurry me along, uh, I basically let them know that if they are, that my work is going to suffer. So, um, you know, I basically tell them that things might take a little bit longer. It's always good to tell them that beforehand so they can anticipate it. But uh, sometimes, you know, you don't know how long it's going to take. So you give yourself a little bit of buffer room. Uh, but you, you know, you also might spend some late nights just getting things done because you're on a tight schedule. And that happens sometimes too. Okay. Um, news on hard service. Is this the way that real cars are made in production or they use programs like Fusion or Moi? Um, okay. So... <laughs> Interestingly enough, I've been working a lot with car companies lately, and uh, I've kind of seen the way that they work, and uh, that's uh, changing. So the reason why I am involved in the car companies is because a lot of them are looking for newer ways uh, to have their cars look. And um, initially, they use a program called Alias from Autodesk, so that's kind of a NURBS-based software that they use and uh, as good as that is it's not very forgiving as far as design is concerned uh, so I don't know if you guys have used NURBS before but um, it's definitely uh, not not fun like just doing something as simple as um, making a big sweeping design change is really difficult so they are introducing some uh, polygon modeling tools into alias to facilitate that for the designers uh, but they definitely don't use moi i don't I have not seen a car company use moi yet but uh, maybe there are there some out there and i really haven't seen car companies use fusion either uh, which would be interesting if they did I think Fusion is more for uh, making CAD objects, but for mostly for cars, they use Alias, um, and that's kind of the tool that they use. But um, but I've been talking to them about using ZBrush, and uh, a lot of companies, are designers, are taking to the idea, and maybe there will be more of them as time goes on. Of course, um, there need to be certain things that have to happen as well, workflows that have to be determined. So as time goes on, um, you know, 
definitely look in this space to see more of um, and here what I'm going to do is just go in and turn on dynamic subdivision uh, for all of these tools so I'm kind of not uh, butting them up against their poly polygonal equivalents but uh, they're subdivided uh, versions right because eventually I'm going to subdivide these and I'm going to add some surface detail and uh, kit bash parts to them Right, so I don't know why this one right here did not do its thing. So let's do do that. D. Okay. And hopefully um, that answers your question. Um, Gas Perlma about um, hard surface. And man, uh, aren't car companies still sculpting clays? Well, they are. Yes, they are. Absolutely. So that's a good point, too. A lot of car companies still sculpt in clay. So they basically make the model in, um, in CAD software, and then they sculpt it in clay as well. And so uh, that's why ZBrush is kind of really cool, because it is very much like sculpting in clay. But it takes them a very long time to do that clay model, man. Um, and it's very expensive. And uh, it's very unforgiving. So if they want to make a design change, then they have to remake that clay model again, <laughs> which is, is never fun, I guess. So yeah, as I uh, said, I'm kind of working a lot more with automotive companies lately and uh, learning more about their workflows and seeing how uh, I can we can use some of these tools to augment those workflows and maybe come up with some interesting design shapes that they are not able to kind of synthesize with what they have. All right, so here I'm just kind of, I need to spend a little bit of time here to get these edges to kind of work well together. And again, I just want to get that, you know, if you look at a car, you can kind of see that this is kind of a very important part of the seamlessness of the transition from one piece to the next. And if this wasn't a car, if it was a robot or something, um, you could do this a little bit. Uh, you can kind of be a little bit less meticulous about it. I don't know what's going on with this piece. I'm going to, oh, I know what's going on with it. Dynamic Subdiv has uh, uh, a feature on that I don't want, so I'm going to turn that off for now. Yep, it's got QGrid on, so I'm going to turn QGrid off. Right. So by the way, that's a, a nifty trick too. I should I should talk about that. Um, so here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, move this off screen for a minute and reload reload it and then go to kind of that other methodology which might save me some time and I forgot that I started I stumbled onto that methodology and it uh, it really kind of worked good and that's the the piece that I had was the one that um, that really worked well for that um, for the spinner so here I'm going to go ahead and load this back in I'm going to lose a little bit of the work that I did, but that's fine because I'm going to just use that workflow instead. All right. Okay, we're back to this. And let's bring that back out. Okay, so the, the thing that I was kind of doing in here, and I think it's this one. Yeah, I started kind of, yeah, this is kind of a little bit further along. I did a little bit more experiments here where I'm actually uh, looking at doing the molding too. So each window on a car usually has molding around it. So here I was experimenting with the molding, but this is really not the one I wanted to load. So if you uh, can forgive me here for another second, let me load in the correct um, correct one because I want to make sure that I don't have um, 
you know some of the the workflow I actually want to do it while I'm doing the the stream so you guys can kind of experiment it with me and I'm still kind of experimenting here I don't have this down to science I've done one car before uh, which is basically with the ones that you see with the promos and maybe I'll load it in at some point but um, here uh, so for for this um, what I've done is I've turned on toy plastic as the uh, material and toy plastic is really good because it kind of gives you that shiny uh, specular which kind of uh, gives you a better idea of the surfaces right so here what I want to do is I want to go in and I want to uh, basically refine all these surfaces to, so they work really well kind of close to each other um, all right, so let's see here. I've got a bunch of different questions. Man, a lot of people watching today, a lot of people asking questions, which is always good. It, it makes uh, the interaction a lot better. I might not go as fast, but um, but it definitely makes life easier for me. Okay, so um, um, okay. All right, looks like this person has a bunch of different things that, that you can get together. Um, well, okay. Um, yeah, I'm not a big fan. I, sh I should say this. I'm not a big fan of Corel. I'm <laughs> just <laughs> putting that out there. Uh, and I, I've, you know, I've bought Painter when it was Fractal Design Painter, you know, and came in the paint can, paint can and I've kind of supported it for uh, a while. And when Corel bought them, I actually even bought a few versions of those. But the last one I bought, they started having pop-up ads that I couldn't turn on. Uh, and I'm sorry, that I couldn't turn off. And that really bugged me. So I'm kind of off the entire Corel uh, Painter thing. Uh, so navigated chaos. I just want to mention that um, I use Photoshop and um, mostly for painting. I use my iPad uh, and I have uh, Procreate and uh, I think another uh, Infinite Painter. I just got that and Adobe uh, Sketch something or another. Th those are good uh, and I just use those. So that's that. Um, who are some good ZBrush artists? Uh, Nick uh, Nakfunu. Um, well, uh, that's a good question too. What I would recommend you do is go to ZBrush Central. So ZBrushCentral.com. Right. And then what you can do here is you can see all these amazing artworks and then you can choose which artists you like, right? Because there's a lot of different artists and there's a lot of different types of works that they do. So if you like monsters, there are some great monster artists. If you like realistic faces, there are some realistic face artists. Uh, there are some hard surface artists. Um, and yeah, so you can see here that there's plenty of amazing artists with plenty of amazing work. And uh, most of these guys, just uh, you can follow them. So I don't know if you're familiar with ZBrush Central, but you can follow them online and you can uh, see their work. Um, the top row usually has some amazing stuff that you can always see. So they always have the best stuff up here. And then these are featured things over in the middle section. And uh, you can see like what's hot nowadays. So you can just click on that and see what the hot works are. And so you can kind of scroll down here. And these are things that I don't know why they're deemed to be hot. Uh, you can click on here to see what the new things are that be, are being added. All right. So uh, and then you can look at things by categories and you can look at the things you're following. So ZBrush Central is a really good place to find uh, good ZBrush artists. And there's quite a few. And uh, it's a great community, probably one of the best software uh, communities out there, uh, if not the best for me. And it's I always find uh, inspiration there all the time. OK, so um, Christian. Um, no, Dynamic Subdiv is really good. So that, what Dynamic Subdiv does is um, I'll just basically uh, here, just go in and add one of these guys, right? And uh, go to a cube. So. Um, by the way, uh, some good news. I've actually um, created a new brush, which I will be giving away for free on Gumroad. So next week I will debut it. 
And it's basically primitives brush, which allows me to put in a bunch of primitives. And uh, it's a kind of one I've been working on for a while. And I think it's something that I want to give away for free. And uh, then I will have some for pay brushes that I come up with. But for now, uh, I'll be giving that away. So here, um, talking about dynamic subdiv, basically what dynamic subdiv does is you have a, a object like this, which is very kind of hard surfacey, hard corners and whatnot. And if you press D, or um, it basically puts it in dynamic subdiv mode. And here's kind of here's the menu for it over here. So if you put it in dynamic subdivision mode, it basically creates kind of a smoother version of it, right? And then you can use Q Grid to choose how smooth that is. So notice here that I'm kind of choosing the smoothness of my edge, and I can use the coverage as well. So just with that cube, I can get a range of different shapes. So if I want a cube, but I don't want it really to have those sharp corners, I can just basically go to dynamic subdiv and add a bevel or a chamfer to it. And then just kind of choose the right kind of setting that I want. And if I'm happy with this, I can just go ahead and say apply. And now I've got a 3D model that is basically that cube, but with softer edges. So it's really useful to kind of get some, uh, get an object that's kind of faceted. So here, let me go back down to this. And if I've got something that's faceted like this, uh, let me turn dynamic off. So you can see this is a really kind of a sharp edge over here. But if I turn dynamic on, um, then it softens it up for me. So I can kind of create more of a softer uh, edge instead of having that kind of sharp edge that a poly polygonal object can have. Okay, so yeah, dynamic subdiv is, is kind of one of the coolest features and it works with everything too. So it works with uh, faces, it works with, um, you know, uh, non hard surface objects as well. And it's super, super useful. All right, so let's go back to the car here. Um, Adrian, how's it going? Um, Dasu, hello. Oh man, there's a lot of people in today. Adrian is uh, laughing and crying. Am I a fan from Adobe? I'm actually not a fan. I just, you know, I find a tool I like and I just use it. Um, I, you know, I just, I liked Corel Painter too. I thought it was good until they started doing pop-up ads. And after that, I'm like, nope, no thank you. Um... Uh, okay, unless it's detailing your base, all the good hard surface are, well, you know, uh, good for you, I guess. Awesome. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and get back into working here. Uh, some really good dialogue going on. I just want to make sure that I, I do get some work done on this model. I've got maybe uh, less than an hour left until I have to go. So... Uh, Let's get back to work. Okay, so here's this piece right here, for example, in the front, right? And if I look at this piece and turn this off, notice that it is polygonal. If I go to dynamic subdiv, it changes this to that. So you can see how, you know, I get something that's very polygonal looking to something being more hard surfacey. And I'm again softening up those kind of corners over here. And I might need to go in and put in a little bit of um, topology to support that. And by the way, this is really kind of low resolution topology, like so. Actually, I get that a lot. When I tell people I use ZBrush for hard surface, they look at me in a weird way. They're like, really? ZBrush is more for like doing pores and hair and, uh, you know, doing like, you know, figurative sculpting. And it's not. I think ZBrush is awesome for hard surface. Um, as a matter of fact, if um, I should also talk about my website. If you go to my website, kermaco.com, and you look at my mechs here. So this mech right here, it's as hard surface as you can get, this one. And I've done this entirely in ZBrush. This entire mech, all of it, all the hard surface parts are done in ZBrush. Right, this one is ZBrush as well. So I started this in Maya, but it ended up in ZBrush. I did this hard surface object at the ZBrush sculpt off. So you can see a lot of my models are hard surface models and they're all made with ZBrush. 
uh, this car that I made, uh, the spinner, this is the one you, you kind of have seen in the promo images. This was 100% done in ZBrush too. And you can see here that I kind of uh, am getting better at doing these kind of corners. This is kind of my current project is to, to get these to work really good. Um, but yeah, um, so, you know, this thing here that I did, this is done in, in uh, ZBrush as well. So ZBrush is awesome for hard surface. You can do a lot of really cool things. These guys, um, this guy here, this Batman guy is done in ZBrush as well. It's also a lot of hard surface parts on it. Uh, this uh, kind of mechanical ghost that I did is also done in ZBrush, 100% in ZBrush. Just a sculpt. Uh, here's this again, done in ZBrush. So yeah, I mean, I use ZBrush for hard surface and I love using ZBrush for hard surface. It is the way to go. Um, sometimes I need to bump, jump out into Moi and get some shapes that I make in Moi or have some shapes that I make in other programs. But um, yeah, <laughs> I'm perfectly happy using ZBrush for hard surface. Um, Adrian, uh, I'm just starting... Uh, is it important to learn C3D software? I mean, it's up to you, right? Uh, personally, I like doing both. I like sketching. I like using 3D software. I think 3D software gives me some capabilities that sketching could not. But um, so here, I'm just kind of refining these parts, getting this to kind of look like more of a car part. And you can see here that uh, the material I have on it, which is the toy plastic, is kind of showing me uh, that really surfacey part. And I've got some soft edges here around the corners, but with some creasing, I can make that work out too. And I guess this is the time to talk about that dynamic subdiv trick that I had. Okay, so with the dynamic subdiv trick, what you can do is you can turn dynamic subdiv on, like I have it over here. And then you can bring in QGrid. And then QGrid gives you kind of sharper corners, like you see over here, right? So, and then you can play around with the, uh, with the coverage to get the sharp corners that you want. Okay, and sometimes if you turn constant off, it's better. And then you can just kind of a little bit, just by hitting it with the shift key, modify this. So you have kind of sharp corners around the edges. And you have a little bit of faceting here in the middle. Right, so I do have some faceting. Like this stuff is really not good. Uh, for um, for a kind of a automotive piece. However, if you accept this, if you apply it, right? So you basically maintain those corners. And then if you uh, go to your smooth tool, you can smooth out. And sometimes, I just learned this new trick at the ZBrush Summit. So here, if you go to smooth brush properties and you go to your, where is it? Weighted smooth, you can increase that to one. And then you get even more smoothing. That's kind of nice. So here you can just kind of smooth out those facets. Let's try and get this weight to two, see what that does. And if I look at this topology, I mean, it's I've got a lot more topology now, but that's fine because I can just go in and uh, accept this the way it is. And certain parts, like if I even want to smooth it, things out further, I can always do H, H polish. Let me bring up my restore custom UI here. So I can use H polish to even get smoother surfaces. So here I'm going to get the smooth surfaces that I want, as well as getting those sharp edges around the corners where the transitions are. Right, so here I'm just using H polish to kind of get these to work. So I'm basically just kind of sculpting the hard surface parts to get a kind of a, a smooth automotive surface. And I don't really care about the inside unless something's going to be opened. This is going to be glass, so I need to just make sure that it looks smooth as glass would look, but it's also a molded piece of glass, so it does have some shape to it. And uh, the thickness could be too much. I can modify that. So I do need to worry about the inside as well. Since it's glass, it's going to just be, you know, kind of a 
a hard piece of glass and I need to make sure that that piece of glass looks uh, looks good. All right, uh, you can sketch in ZBrush. Yeah, uh, Ian, you can definitely sketch in ZBrush. You can 2D sketch. There's actually a whole 2D tool built into ZBrush. I mean, of course, it's not as good as Photoshop, but you can sketch and you can also paint on your objects. So I can actually go in here and uh, if I choose the paint tool here, and maybe switch these colors this way for the object and let's choose red. I can actually paint on my surface, right? So uh, yeah, it's pretty neat. Let's go back to white here and let's go back to polishing. Move tool. I'm going to try and even see like what happens if I take this to three. All right, so there's that. And notice here that I've got three different subdivisions. So a better thing to do maybe is to go down in subdivision levels and um, smooth things out at the lower subdivision levels and then see if it translates over to the higher subdivision levels. All right, so this piece of glass is coming along nicely. I kind of want to have this little bit of a groove over here and I'm just going to go ahead and accept the fact that that's going to happen in the glass itself. And actually, even though I have three subdivision levels of this, it's not really making that big of a difference. So I'm just going to delete the higher subdivision levels. I don't need them right now. I can add them later. You want to keep, you got to be really efficient with your geometry. Notice here that um, that corner got soft. So again, move with AccuCurve gives me that sharp corner. And the other thing also uh, I should mention is that if you want to kind of bring up some of the edges, Damien Standard is good for that too. So here I'm just going to use Damien Standard to kind of harden that corner, maybe push this corner in a bit. Right. So I'm using all these tools that a lot of artists use for um, not hard surface stuff and using them for hard surface. Um, there was a really good presentation uh, on hard surface modeling, like Marco, uh, I think uh, both Cedric and Marco from um, Chaos Masons showed some cool robotic stuff with hard surface. If you guys haven't watched those, I highly recommend you watch them. There were some amazing presentations this year at the ZBrush Summit, and those videos are all available online. You can watch them. Uh, the good thing about ZBrush is if you want to learn, there's a lot of great stuff out there. Just want to make sure you get your fundamentals down, and then after that, it's a great adventure. Um, how do I... Uh, okay, so uh, Adrian, you're asking how can I export this to another software? Just export it. Uh, you can export as OBJ, so here. Under export, you can export it as an OBJ file, right? Or, so here's the export button. Or you can also, there's a plugin in here, uh, where Z plugin, and there's also an FBX export import, so you can export it as FBX as well. So you can export it in different ways to other DCC software, and you can also import um, from other software if you want to. Right, so I'm spending a lot of time on this piece, and I'm going to be doing the same thing with all the other pieces. I might not do them all uh, while I'm on camera, but uh, I will definitely go in and just uh, modify these. So again, here I'm just using two or three different brushes. I'm using the Move brush. I'm using the H Polish brush to get kind of these surfaces. And again, I don't want to really spend a lot of time uh, making this perfect, right? Because again, it's just going to be maybe viewed at this size. And so I would just want to make sure that at this size, that these surfaces are coming out really smooth. 
so the glass shows up that it's glass and uh, I will add the borders I mean they matter but they don't matter that much because I'm also going to add some molding if you look at any glass on a car there's molding around it and molding is so easy to do in uh, ZBrush it's not even funny and I'll show you how to do that as soon as I'm done with this refining it to this point and I think at this point I'm okay with this being a piece of glass uh, if I want to test it out of course I can always uh, shoot it into Keyshot and see what it will look like and I think it's a little bit too thick here but this is going to be in the front of the car so it, it would probably be a thick piece of glass something like bulletproof glass um, that's weird Okay, here we go. The music just decided to make itself louder. I don't know how. Um, um, is there a way for NURBS? Uh, ZBrush doesn't have NURBS. ZBrush has no NURBS. So you cannot export ZBrush models as NURBS. Although you can import um, CAD models into here, you can import STL and whatnot, but you cannot export this as a NURBS model. I don't know why you'd want to, but I'm sure if you have a reason, um, you will be unable to export it as NURBS. I don't know. I've I have you know the only NURBS program that I use is Moi, and uh, the only reason why I like using Moi is because it exports NURBS into really nice OBJs, and Moi does that really well, better than any program I've seen. Uh, I've used CAD programs, at least ones that are uh, the price of Moi, which is pretty inexpensive. Um, Jay Connor chat, are NURBS still relevant in our field? And what field is that? Do you mean for, uh, for what specifically do you mean as far as field? I mean, NURBS are definitely relevant. Moi uses NURBS and I love Moi. It's a nice program. Um, you can get some really interesting shapes with it that you can't in other programs. Um, so I would say yes, you know, for um, for concept design, uh, NURBS are still relevant, but it's a different kind of a mentality. You have to really kind of understand how that works. Okay, so I think I've kind of massaged this thing enough to the point where I'm happy with it. And notice here that it's pretty light at this point. It's uh, what it's about. Um, well, it's not that light. It's still quite a few polygons. But let's get to go ahead and take a look at. Um, what we've got here and ZBrush has this really nice feature call uh, where I can see if I can simplify this at all so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to turn off polyframe and I'm going to go ahead and create a duplicate of it because I just want to make sure that I work on the duplicate okay and um, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to go ahead and go to um, edge loop and I'm just going to do delete loops. Okay, so I did delete loops and it just gave me this. Let's go ahead and take a look at it. So it looks like it took away quite a few polygons here and gave me a much lighter model. Let's see how thick. Okay, so I went to 29,000, uh, or I can't really actually see it. I think it's about 29,000 polygons, which is less than what I had before, which was 43. So, you know. That's 10,000 polygons less, so I will go ahead and accept that. Um, and let's go ahead and take a look at it without the polyframe. And I kind of like this little lip it put around it. It kind of creates, it, it kind of looks more manufactured. I don't want to soften up these corners though. So yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I think I will keep this. I will keep this version of the model, maybe soften up these areas a bit. Okay, so now let's talk about how we do the molding, right? The molding is basically something that goes around the glass to hold it in, right? And so to do that, 
um, so when I did these, I basically just uh, Q-meshed or extruded out the parts, or I, I might have even used uh, um, group loop or um, panel loops. I'm not sure. I think I did use panel loops actually. So I've got this piece like this, and if I go to polyframe, you'll notice that it's got a uh, different polygroup around the outside part, right? And so what I want to do here is I just want to go ahead and um, QMesh, polygroup, all. So I'm just going to be QMeshing this polygroup. And notice if I do that, it's just going to do this. Right? Is this a different polygroup? I guess it is. Well, actually, this even works better. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to just do exactly what I did, and that's going to be my molding. Uh, but I don't know why this inside part is a different polygroup. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to make sure that all of it is one polygroup. So polygroup, um, and let's do polygroup island, and this one here. If I do this, it's going to do that. And if I do this, it's going to do that. So now I basically have all this outside part as one polygroup. Okay, which is fine. And so now I go back to QMesh polygroup all and so when I do this it's going to create that molding for me right but I don't want that to be part of the glass because I'm probably going to assign a different material to it so if I hold control down after I do the Q mesh it actually separates out a part like this so it just separates out this piece right like that oops I guess I have to do it one more time Actually, another thing I want to do here is I don't know if I need this in, these inside edge loops. So I'm just going to see if I uh, lose anything by deleting them. Delete edge loop complete. Nope, actually I don't lose anything. Well, no, I kind of like this roundness of it, so I'm just going to keep it. Okay, so um, I'm going to Q mesh polygroup all and when I pull this out like so if I hold control down it actually creates a separate piece so I'm going to create that separate piece but I'm going to push it inside the model right so it's gonna kinda this is a little bit tricky um, so I'm gonna do this again hold control down um, start the Q mesh, hold control down, and just kind of maybe just get it out this much, right? So that basically created a separate piece, or it should have. Uh, let's do that one more time. I'm going to remove this delete edge so I don't ac accidentally delete edges. Um, here we go. Okay, so now I have, I don't know why it's still connecting it. I don't want it to connect. Come on, let's do this one more time. Control, let go. Here we go. Right, so now I've got this other piece. And if I look at my subtools, there it is, right? This is the piece that I've uh, just created. And what I want to do is I want to um, Q-mesh this outside piece now. Just like that, okay? So now I've got molding that's going around this thing, and if I separate this out, so if I go here and go and say split to parts, okay, so you notice here that I've got the glass and then I, I've got the molding, right, so there's the molding right there. And then with the molding, what I do usually is, uh, I think this is just fine the way it is, but sometimes I go ahead and apply a little bit of inflate to it, so I'll go to deformation, and do a little bit of inflation like this and inflate balloon could work too just kind of add a little bit of thickness to it and so now if I bring this back and I'm just gonna go ahead and hide all the other sub tools and just look at these two take go off solo you can see that here that I've created a molding around this and I can use the inflate brush itself to just kind of maybe do a little bit of more kind of inflation on around the edges here where I want that molding to go. All right, so just inflate this a little bit. And so now this has a nice molding around it. And I did that very, very quickly just by using Q mesh and the control key.
All right. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, cool. Moto is nice, too. Yeah, I've used Moto before. Um, I haven't upgraded, though. I don't know if there's anything new that I should be looking at. Uh, but yeah, I've used Moto in the past. And uh, let's see. Matt's, uh, in terms of Max that are smoothing grooves, or am I wrong? Smoothing, yeah, I don't, you know, I just basically, I mean, I could use smoothing grooves for this, but I'm basically just using geometry. I'm not smoothing anything. I'm just basically smoothing it by using more geometry. Uh, it looks like I've got a little bit of compression over here. So um, one of the things you can do here is, uh, again, maybe try and delete some of these edge loops over here. That would kind of remove that compression. Or I can soften it up and just inflate these parts over here. Actually, I don't think it matters. I think this looks fine. Okay, so now I've got my piece of glass and I also have uh, the um, molding around it and notice here that ZBrush is saving the file for me which is great um, yeah Adrian I mean it's just one of these things where you have to you know you have to spend the time uh, ZBrush is one of those tools that you can't just pick it up and be like okay I'm working in it now you have to spend a little bit of time especially initially just to kind of get used to the interface and then over time you start you keep adding to your knowledge I've been using it for quite a while now and uh, I feel like I'm kinda got a handle on it right but um, it wasn't always like that so you just have to spend the time to do it and again it all depends on the results right like if you like the results you see on ZBrush Central and what artists are doing there and you want to do similar things then maybe it's a good idea for you to take the time take a class um, I teach a ZBrush class at Otis and the students there come in not knowing anything about ZBrush and in 15 weeks, uh, we have a wall full of characters that they make, and they're pretty happy with that. Um, so taking a class sometimes helps. There are online classes as well. Um, and you can look at, at their education site. A lot of people are self-taught too, so you know maybe you can learn by yourself. That's always a good thing too. Okay, all right, so um, here we go. Let's go ahead and turn polyframe off. So I've got the molding here around it, and that looks okay. It's a little bit too thick on the outside, so I can go ahead and maybe see if I can scale it down a bit. And here I'm going to turn symmetry off. There we go. And just for kicks, I'm going to go ahead and color this a darker color. Right, so I can kind of see what the molding looks like. And I'm glad I did that because it looks like it's intersecting in some areas. But I can very easily go in and pull that stuff out by using the Move tool. Let's turn symmetry back on. I think that's one of the things that I tell this, my students all the time is that things take time. Learning something takes time. It takes time and effort and energy. You know, the matrix kind of learning, the Neo kind of thing is not, uh, you know, reality yet. And of course, right now the molding is shiny, but it's not going to be shiny when I um, pick the material for it in, in uh, Keyshot. I'll probably choose some sort of rubbery material for it. But right now, I just want to make sure that it, I do have a nice border around my piece of glass. So a lot of what I'm going to be doing, um, and I'll probably maybe do some of this offline, is just this, right? I'm going to be doing this kind of work with all the rest of the model. And um, let's bring it back. So I'm going to make sure that these are all hidden. 
uh, at least that piece is. And uh, gosh, I brought everything back, didn't I? That's not what we wanted to do. So let me go ahead and hide this. And yeah, this is all I want is just these parts. Like so. Okay, and I don't need that. So here I can see that this part right now is pretty much finished. So I need to work on parts around it. So maybe I'll work on either, I'll work on this part, which is basically the big windshield. Kind of an important part. So here I'm just going to move this out of the way here to kind of define the area where that uh, molding is. And again, you know, this is kind of a new thing for me, um, doing the hard surface work in, uh, for cars. And cars are probably the most um, kind of demanding hard surfaces. So I'm still figuring out a good workflow to get these sharp edges. But um, there are some really good ZBrush car artists out there that have done some good car models with ZBrush. But... Um, Again, it's just a matter of getting getting there. And this looks like it's pretty detailed. Did I already? Um, yeah, this thing is pretty already pretty detailed. So I kind of want to make sure that I don't have it this. You know, I don't have this much topology on it. So I'm going to go ahead and see if I can uh, reduce some of this geometry so that I can work with more of a. Um, See if delete loops helps. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, this has an upper high. Yeah, I'm going to delete all the higher subdivision levels. That's kind of the issue. All right, cool. So yeah, it's always good to work on on these things in lower subdivision level. Let me just go to solo here, and it looks like I've got some of these overlapping corners I got to fix. And I basically used the same exact uh, methodology on the windshield, where I basically did the um, dynamic subdiv with QGrid and then uh, smoothed out the inside parts. But I just need to make sure that these corners are sharp on their own. Um, is there a way to detect mesh intersections? Are you talking about like what I had here or um, separate pieces intersecting? Adrian. And also, retopo function is epic. Are you talking about the retopo function in ZBrush or the one that I showed earlier in Maya? Okay, so here what I'm doing is again just kind of getting these corners. And I, you always want to kind of bring that other piece back just to kind of see what that transition is going to be from one shape to the next. And here I'm just going to go ahead and hide everything else. So all I have is this piece and these two pieces. So I just want to make sure that I get this transition over here to be just right. Um, yeah, there is actually a um, there's a plugin that they came out with called Intersection Master or something like that. That basically, if you have two pieces, it will show you um, what part is intersecting. I mean, it's not meant for that. It's meant for other things, but uh, it will do that for you as well. And I think it, yeah, Intersection Master right here. Uh, so it will basically create an intersection mask between two objects that tell you what is intersecting. Okay, so I'm just kind of trying to fit these two pieces together nicely. And then of course, I just have to work on the transition. So I kind of want this kind of bulky, or not bulky, but poofed out look. I don't want this to be kind of like a smooth piece. And if I do, I can make it, but I kind of like that because it was in my initial design. Um, Okay, Ruth, have a great night. Thank you for uh, tuning in. And again, if you want to uh, watch future episodes, I'm on Friday nights, every other Friday from uh, 7 to 9. Uh, I'm in LA, so I guess that's Pacific time.
right, let's do that. Okay, so here I'm just basically working on that transition between the two surfaces. And this is kind of a very important thing with hard surface, especially cars, is this transition between one surface to the next. On a lot of car forums, people complain about these cut lines and how they're not exactly the same size. So, of course, this is not going to be manufactured, this car, so I don't really need to be worry about it that much. But at least it has to look right. At least from a, a distance. All right, how are we doing on time? It's 8.49. Okay, so we got about another... 10 minutes to go. So if you have some last questions, ask them now. And next, uh, in a couple of weeks when we come back, hopefully I will have more of this done. It's basically going to be the same exact thing I'm doing here. I'm just going to be doing it with the rest of the car. And I might do some of it on screen. I might not finish it off, depending on what my work schedule is like. And so you, you'll get to see more of this. And again, I was hoping to finish this project in the um, in eight weeks, but I think it's going to go to 10 weeks, um, hopefully not longer. And if you ask more questions, it takes more time. But I think that's kind of part of this streaming process is answering questions and whatnot. So make sure to tune in next week because then I'll be talking about the primitives uh, IMM brush that I'm going to be giving away on Gumroad to everybody. So if you're tuning in, you can see it. Of course, you can always watch it after the fact in, uh, and find out the link then too. Okay, so now I like the transition between these two surfaces. And um, if I look at it, let's say from this angle over here, it looks fine and I might have some hinges or other pieces that go in between so for now I think this will do just fine maybe shrink this down a bit and of course the cock uh, the the uh, windshield is going to be a piece of glass too so I also have to worry about it on the inside as well So again, here I'm just using the move tool with AccuCurve to get those sharp corners and get a good transition between the two pieces of glass over here that are going to overlap. And again, I can maybe um, hide some of this with um, some kit bash parts here that are going to be the hinge and whatnot. So it looks like here um, this is definitely not coming together right so I would have to figure out some sort of a part or something to put over here or let me see if I can actually move this out as well let's see if that kind of works out kind of does kind of doesn't kind of liked it the way it was before so I'm just going to leave it that so this piece here it looks like it's not really butting up against it which is fine because I could put like a hinge or something in here to kind of hide that uh, that piece. And also, where is my molding? There it is. Okay. Yeah, that's working out fine. And again, I've got that shiny material on there, um, and I don't really need the molding around the uh, around the glass to have a shiny material. But for now, it's kind of good because it shows me the highlights, shows me the smoothness of the surface. And so the windshield is looking pretty good. I might need to maybe add a little bit of faceting to it. And again, I always have to consider the material that's being used. So glass is the material here. And glass can only do so much shape change. So I need to kind of take that into consideration. All right. 
Okay, so uh, let's see, last few questions. Uh, Adrian, you're welcome. Um, yeah, I will give you the link next time. It's almost done. It's, it's about 90% done, and then I just will give you the link. It's just a quick way to kind of drop um, primitives in your scene. I know ZBrush has their own, so there's a primitives brush here. Uh, mine's kind of uh, has some similar things, but also has a few different things. And it just kind of pertains to more the way I work, but some people might want to work that way too, so why not share it? Okay, so uh, this piece of glass is going to have uh, some kind of interesting corners here, and I need to do some molding for this as well. Uh, so I'll be working on that next. All right, let's see what that looks like with the rest of the car. The other thing also to note is that um, there are a lot of pieces in the car. I mean, not that many, but there still are a lot of pieces. So, um, you know, there's a lot of repetitive work in what we do. And you have to be ready for it. Oops. So I have to do the same kind of thing that I've done to this piece to all the different car pieces over here. And as I mentioned to you, I'll be doing some of this off screen, but I'll be doing a lot of it on screen as well. And it's kind of gonna be the finishing touches. So then after that's done, then I just basically will kit bash some parts on here to uh, create some interest, kit bash some parts into the interior. So maybe we'll do one day just doing that and then just take it into Keyshot and start doing look dev on it, which is going to be the most fun part because that's when you really see what the finished product is going to look like. All right. And here I'm faceting out the glass a bit and you can do that with glass uh, just to kind of get a little bit of an interesting look. That's good. And then I want to see what the inside of this looks like. And the inside doesn't have to be faceted, it could be smooth. And um, I just want to make sure that these are corners are sharp. And then I will attach these to the door. Okay, I think time-wise we're getting pretty close here. Um, if anybody... Um, yeah, it is. It's, you know, there's no shortcuts. I mean, there are shortcuts, of course, but uh, there's a lot of drudgery as well. Like the retopology was very kind of, it's, it was drudgery in Maya. Um, it took you know, maybe half a day to get it all retopoed. And it was just a lot of repetitive work. You know, the more parts you have, the more parts you have to work with. But um, hopefully you get some enjoyment out of it. And we might have to UV some of these parts, but I probably will use UV Master. I'm probably not going to do detailed UVing in, uh, in a UV program. Okay, saludos to you too, Edison. Thank you for tuning in. Wow, today is, I think, been the biggest number of people tuning in. So uh, glad to have you all and look forward to having some more of you on uh, in a couple of weeks. So just to kind of give you an idea of when my next stream is going to be, uh, it's going to be on Sep uh, or sorry, October the 18th. Okay, so the next stream is going to be October 18th on Friday. And it will be same time from 7 to 9 p.m. And uh, I might go a little bit longer next time. I don't know, depending on how much work we get done. All right, so I think I'm getting close to time here. So I guess I will stop at this point. It's always a good idea to do a save. Uh, and uh, we will see you all 
in a couple of weeks. Have a good night, day, wherever you are, and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.